Good evening and welcome to our sixth webinar on the Festival for Advent. And it is good to have your company at this hour. So let us just relax and be still and come into our hearts. Be still and know that God is present. And tonight we make a journey with the Holy Family to Bethlehem as they cross the Judean hills in the dark. And the reason for doing that is because of the heat in the sun, from the sun. For the desert can become an oven and with a young woman pregnant, it would be just too much for her. So Joseph decided to travel at night, where it's a lot cooler, and rest during the day in a shady spot. So we begin by just inviting you to reflect. What does Advent mean for you? What is it asking of you? It's a time of preparation, preparing your soul to welcome the rebirthing of the infant king the Messiah in your heart, in your life. And I would like to begin by first sharing with you some thoughts and reflections from Awakening to God by Delia Smith. In Matthew 7, 24, 27, we read, therefore everyone who listens to these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who built his house on rock. Rain came down, floods rose, gales blew, and hurled themselves against that house. And it did not fall. It was founded on rock. But everyone who listens to these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a stupid man who built his house on sand. Rain came down, floods rose, gales blew and struck that house, and it fell. And what a fall it had. Today's reading takes us a stage further on from yesterday. Simply hearing the word of God is not enough. Being willing to listen is the first requirement, but being willing to act and be obedient to what the word is saying. That is the acid test. If we're really committed to hearing the word of God, one of the things it will begin to teach us is the ultimate test of our belief. Trusting God's providence in all the circumstances of our lives. First, though, let's look at yet another of the portraits of the Bible of what God is like. This time we are given the image of the rock, symbolizing strength, safety, total security. It was also an image the prophet Isaiah perceived when he proclaimed that we should trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord is the everlasting rock. His strength, in other words, is eternal, invulnerable to storms or other hazards. His faithfulness and mercy last from age to age. But equally powerful is the image of refuge and safety. As the psalmist asserts, be a rock of refuge for me, a mighty stronghold to save me. In the shifting landscape of the desert, the rock is a symbol of permanence. It is a very comprehensible one for people to grasp. In the course of the Exodus, the rock becomes providential. When Moses strikes it with his staff, it provides water in the desert. And St. Paul explains, 
that this rock was Christ through whom the Holy Spirit would be poured out as living water to bless all mankind. When Jesus gives Simon a new name, it is Kephas, Peter, meaning rock. He promises that his church will be steadfast, eternal. So we are instructed today to build our faith on an everlasting rock, a belief that will endure suffering and hardship, is one that is based on solid reality and if we are obedient to the Word of God, we will eventually begin to step out in trust, understanding that this rock-like power can sustain us far beyond anything we can imagine. But to say, Lord, Lord, to do all the right things, even to offer a lifetime of good works, is not enough. What the gospel teaches us is radical commitment and radical trust. Jesus himself tells us, do not worry about anything. Set your hearts on the kingdom of heaven and God's righteousness first and that all that you need will be given to you as well. And that's at the end of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. I believe one of the signs of a life lived in obedience to the Word of God is, guess what? Serenity. Serenity in a person is a sure sign of faith built on a rock of trust. And to achieve this, we need to build up a relationship of real trust by learning how to trust God in the little everyday circumstances of our lives. If you are a person who tends to worry, why not start right now? Just pray and ask the Holy Spirit to bring to mind some small anxiety that has been nagging away at you, then simply ask God to deal with it. Every time you feel it coming back to niggle you, call on God, name it, bless it, and release it to God in a spirit of mindful gratitude. Stand back and see the miracle of God. The spiritual journey of trust can be very stimulating and exciting, but we can only learn to trust in big things when we start to trust with the small things. If you look at a map of the Middle East, you'll see that 40 years to make the exodus from Egypt was a long time to make a short journey. But that was because God was training the people to trust. Every time they failed, he sent them off on another lap. And in more modern times, if you want to move more quickly on your journey with the Lord, remember this. The fast lane on the motorway is called trust. So let us pray. In God is my safety and glory, the rock of my strengths. Take refuge in God, all you people. Trust him at all times. Pour out your hearts before him, for God is our refuge and our strengths, and in him we trust. And that comes from the beautiful Psalm 62. Be still and know that God is here. Be still and know that the Holy One who has called you out from the wilderness is with you now. How do I know these things? I just know intuitively that when we call on God, 
he hears us. But the downside is if we're not willing to listen and make time to listen, then we won't know what plan God has for us. And sadly, the disease of the modern times is to live in the fast lane and have everything yesterday or an expectation that everything will be given yesterday. That's not how God works. I found that myself as a monk on this pilgrim journey. Better to have no expectations and to do the little things with grace and to trust and that what will be will be for the grace and the sacrament is in the little things done well. And we have great examples of that with the little dress of this year. On day six, the emphasis is staying close to God. But how do we stay close to God? If you want to follow Jesus, you must control what you, what you take in every day. Because you know we are blinded by the media. We live in a give me, give me culture. I want, I must have. You just listen to the little children when they go to the supermarket with their mom and dad. Their hands are grabbing. And there's a lot of adults just like them who are immature. They want, they must have, at any cost, at any price. When you are on the bus or subway or in your car, why busy your mind with all the garbage of advertisements? Why fill your mind with television and radio? Somehow you have to decide what your mind will receive. I don't mean you shouldn't ever go to the movies or watch television, but control what enters your mind and your heart. It's not just a question of pushing bad things out, but a question of holding on to something really good. It is good to have a prayer on your lips wherever you go. There are so many moments in life when you are free to pray. When you are waiting for the cashier in the supermarket, when you're stood in a long chain of customers waiting to put the, their goods on the carousel, waiting for the, the checkout girl or assistant to cash up. Often at this time of year, there's quite long queues and that's a good time. Instead of getting ratty and irritable, to just quietly reflect and offer a prayer of love to God and bless the cashier, bless the person in front of you and bless all the moaning biddies behind you. And a prayer I'd like to share with you is, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Take that prayer with you wherever you go. And that's from John Henry Newman. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 to 18, we read, Be at peace among yourselves, and admonish the idlers, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them, see that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another, to all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And a lovely prayer reads, Lord, let my life be an unceasing prayer to you despite its labours and losses. Grant me a gracious heart that overflows with gratitude to overcome and wash away 
all my worries and fears, my anxieties, my inhibitions. Amen. Let us now follow Jesus and Mary, the baby Jesus in Mary's womb with Joseph, as they walk across the Judean hills. In a short while, daybreak will come and they need to find a place to rest Mary, for her feet are swollen. She's becoming really uncomfortable, straddled on the donkey, with the baby Jesus inside her, kicking, wanting to come out, but it's not time yet. And Mary is exhausted, and you are there. You are supporting her. You're there reassuring her with wonderful words and she re she respects you she loves you for she appreciates your kindness your empathy and your understanding let's visualize the scene shall we it's dark the stars are shining and all is well in this beautiful desert plain where Mary is ready to relax now, with you by her side with Joseph. And the donkey is doing its best to avoid the rocks and the stones strewn along the hills of the Judean hillside. But there's a serenity here, and Joseph trusts choirs of angels who are singing to him and guiding him along this dark pathway to Bethlehem. But in the very, very far distance, he can see a glimmer of light from the dwellings there. So he knows he's on track. But being an older man than Mary, she, he finds the journey stressful and tiring but he doesn't give in. He doesn't wallow and feel sorry for himself. He asks the Spirit of God to come upon him so that he's there for the, the Virgin Mary. And as you walk along the desert floor, you're humming a tune and Mary enjoys it for it takes her mind off the newborn babe kicking in her womb and the discomfort to her lower back sat on the donkey for hours and you're humming a beautiful tune to her and she joins in humming with you it's a beautiful sound And in the not too far distance, Joseph can see a rock face. And he says to Mary, should we camp here? Or would you rather we carry on for another hour? And she was saying, let us stop. Let us relax for we have walked for 10 hours and your feet must be sore. So they come to the rock face and there's like a little well of stone where someone, the Bedouins obviously had lit a fire there and there was embers burning. So you go and find some driftwood and you place it on the embers, create a little fire to warm Mary. And Joseph gets the billy can out and makes some lemon chamomile tea for Mary. And he relaxes her by holding her. And you gracefully apply some oil to her feet. You massage her feet, working on those pressure points that are taut and tensed. And you can see her drifting to a relaxed state, for she has had a treacherous journey with lots of cramp and discomfort. 
and your gentle massage of the hands on her aching, weary, dusty feet is allowing her to experience complete relaxation and you can see it in her eyelids. Her eyes are closing now and she's resting and comfortable. And Joseph finds an old blanket of sorts and places it under her head as a pillow places his stole over her and she sleeps contentedly and he then places his hands on her womb where he can see and feel the infant king of kings kicking away and he just speaks to it through touch relax now and he asks you to place your hands on Mary's abdomen and you can feel the baby Jesus inside, raring to get out. It's a beautiful feeling that you are connecting with the Messiah to be. And all is well. And the place has become peace-filled and calm. And you can see the flame now less. You can smell the driftwood and the sandalwood. It's hypnotic and it's allowing you to doze next to Mary and Joseph. The ox or the ass is well and truly settled and snoring his little heart out. And the Holy Family are lying there and you as their guardian. But angels are watching over all of you. They are singing lullabies to the unborn King of Kings. And as you close your eyes, you can sense a legion of many angels around you, protecting the Christ child, protecting Mary and Joseph. Relax and be aware that where you are and who you're with here, you are with Saint Joseph and the Virgin Mary, the mother of God to be, the mother of God's son, Emmanuel. And with each in-breath that you breathe in, you are breathing in that serenity unconditional love. It is a beautiful love because it's selfless, it's reverent, it's healing, it's empowering. And it leaves you feeling in a place of bliss. But the journey has been worth it. This Advent, be generous in your prayers for others and their well-being. Be generous in your prayers for others and their well-being. And we come now and we bid you pleasant dreams as you sleep with Mother Mary and Joseph. And you allow the angels of the Lord God minister unto you to give you strength, to empower your heart, reawaken to the divine as you prepare for the coming of the Christ within you, the rebirthing of the Messiah in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit. Relax now.
I am a child of God. You may choose to say this mantra. I am a child of God. I am loved. I am loved. I am loved. Thank you for joining me. And I look forward to resuming the meditation and the journey with you again tomorrow evening. But for now, just stay relaxed and enjoy coming home to you.